Welcome to The Color of Law and Reversing Segregation with Richard Rothstein. My name is Tracy Gossage and I will be your program host this evening. Now, before we, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I wanna give a big thank you to the many, many libraries that work together to make this event happen and who I somehow managed to fit all on this one slide. So this program was co-sponsored by nearly 50 Illinois libraries in order to bring this presentation to you. I also wanna give special thanks to the following organizations, RAIN, Racial Awareness in the North Shore, and TIBA, the Together is Better Alliance. Both of these multiracial groups promote education and activism on racial justice. You can connect with them by visiting their websites and Facebook events to learn about future events and opportunities to get involved yourself. I'm also going to give a big thank you to Bruce Bondi specifically. So he is a steering committee member of both of these groups and he did a lot of work to get us in touch with Richard Rothstein for this program tonight. Okay. And then now tonight, as we learn more about the history of which groups were allowed to live where, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that we're all viewing this program on native lands. I am currently introducing this program from land where Kickapoo, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people lived till colonization removed them from their lands. Today, there are no federally recognized tribes in Illinois even though our state is home to over 100,000 indigenous people from over 175 different tribes who continue to contribute to our communities today. We respectfully acknowledge the indigenous people on whose ancestral homelands we gather today, albeit virtually, as we discuss injustices of the past and present and work to move towards justice and reconciliation. I'm now honored to introduce our speaker, Richard Rothstein. Richard Rothstein is a distinguished fellow of the Economic Policy Institute and a senior fellow of the Fergood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He is the author of The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, as well as many articles and books on race and education. And now I will turn things over to Richard. Thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, and thanks to all of you for engaging with me in this uh, conversation this evening. As you all know, in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. It began by a challenging uh, racial segregation in law schools in the 1930s, and then went on to challenge segregation of colleges and universities. And then in 1954, as you know, it persuaded the Supreme Court to ban legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And that Brown versus Board of Education gave impetus, stimulus, inspiration to a group of activists. They engaged in marches, in demonstrations, in civil disobedience. Some people lost their lives. Others were severely injured in that struggle. But by the end of the 1960s, that civil rights movement had pretty much persuaded much of the country, not everybody, but much of the country, that uh, racial segregation was wrong, that it was immoral, that it was harmful to both blacks and whites, that it was incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. With that understanding, <clears throat> the civil rights movement was successful in ending segregation in public accommodations, restaurants, lunch counters, in public transportation, buses, trains, in employment. And then in the wake of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, the civil rights movement succeeded in getting past a Fair Housing Act that prohibited legal ongoing segregation, that has prohibited uh, uh, ongoing segregation, ongoing discrimination in the sale and rental of housing. And then uh, the civil rights movement pretty much ended went home, left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area that I've lived in, everyone, and every metropolitan area in the nation is residentially segregated. Uh, everyone that I've lived in, including the Chicago area, had clearly defined areas that were either all white or mostly white, clearly defined areas that were either all black or mostly black. How could it be? <clears throat> 
if we came to an understanding that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and whites, incompatible with a, our self-conception as a constitutional democracy, how could it be that we left untouched the biggest segregation of all? We live in an apartheid society. I'm sure most of us feel like it's too bad, but we accept it. But we've never undertaken an obligation to do anything about it. Well, I think the reason that we've left this racial segregation, this residential segregation untouched, it's partly because it's hard to undo. If we uh, prohibit segregation in restaurants, the next day you sit anywhere in the restaurant you want, you go to any restaurant you want. If we pass an ordinance prohibiting restaurant segregation, but if we prohibit segregation in neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. So what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, blacks, whites, liberals, conservatives, northerners, southerners, Democrats, Republicans, as we've adopted a national rationalization. An excuse we give ourselves for failing to undertake what we're constitutionally obligated to do, and that is to redress uh, segregation and its effects. And the excuse goes something like this. We tell ourselves that the segregation of restaurants and transportation and in many cases, employment, schools and colleges, that was all done by government. If the federal government was requiring segregation, that was a Fifth Amendment violation, a violation of the Constitution, something that we have an obligation as Americans to be concerned about, to redress. If the federal government was creating segregation, it was a Fifth Amendment violation. If state and local governments were creating segregation, that was a 14th Amendment violation. And these are civil rights violations, uh, things we have an obligation to do something about. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, that's something entirely different. That wasn't done by government. That wasn't done by law, by regulation, by public policy. That just sort of happened by accident. It happened because uh, private uh, landowners or, or, or homeowners refused to sell or rent uh, to African-Americans in, in white neighborhoods. Maybe um, uh, private businesses like banks and realtors and developers discriminated in how they carried out their private sector housing activities. Or maybe it's just because uh, African-Americans and whites, we live li like to live with each other of the same race. Uh, we feel more comfortable that way and that's why we're segregated. Or maybe um, uh, it's because of income differences. On average, African-Americans have lower incomes than whites. And so many African-Americans can't afford to move to uh, higher opportunity communities. All of these uh, individual bigoted, but uh, private sector uh, activities, uh, self-choice, uh, economic differences is what's created residential segregation. And we tell ourselves what happened by accident can only unhappen by accident. What happened naturally can only unhappen naturally. As I said, we don't like it. Most of us, we think it's too bad, but we don't feel an obligation to do anything about it. Well, I spent much of my career before I wrote this book, The Color of Law, studying education policy. I knew nothing about housing. I was an education policy writer. I was an education columnist at the New York Times for a while, and then a, a policy writer on education for a think tank in Washington. I came to understand that the uh, segregation policies that we were following, the, I'm sorry, the education policies that we were following uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, made no sense. Uh, at the time, we had a national consensus that there was an achievement gap between black and white children. That was true. African-American children achieve at lower levels than white children. Uh, but we explained to ourselves that the reason for this achievement gap was that the teachers had low expectations of black children. They didn't try very hard when they taught black children. And if we can only force teachers to try harder, the achievement gap would disappear. I thought this was a ludicrous theory, uh, but it was enacted into law, as you may recall, in 2001 in the No Child Left Behind Act. Um, uh, that law uh, required um, uh, schools to report the test scores of their children by race. And the idea was that uh, if children were tested every year and the scores reported by the racial breakdown of their uh, students, uh, the achievement gap would disappear because teachers would be so shamed by this gap that they would try harder. Uh, 
I thought this was a ludicrous theory. Of course, there are some teachers who don't try hard, but most teachers try very hard. That's not the reason we have an achievement gap in schools. The reason we have an achievement gap is because so many African-American children come to school with social and economic disadvantages that impede their ability to take advantage of what even the hardworking, most hardworking teachers have to offer. We've had this law, the No Child Left Behind law, aimed at shaming teachers in place now for 20 years. The achievement gap is about the same as it was when the law was adopted. Uh, the only thing the law has accomplished is um, to give schools an incentive to abandon a well-rounded curriculum so that they can drill children more in test-taking skills to try to raise their test scores. Well, the reason, as I say, that we have an achievement gap is not lazy teachers. It's that the, the social and economic conditions that children come to school with. And I remember writing one column about asthma. As you may know, African-American children uh, in urban neighborhoods have asthma at many times the rate of um, middle-class white children. Uh, in Chicago, it's four times the rate. Uh, it's an enormous difference. If a child has asthma, that child is more likely, not in every case, but more likely uh, to come to school uh, drowsing the next day because the child's been up at night wheezing. Um, if you have two groups of children who are identical in every respect, same social and economic background, same family structure, same racial composition, but one group has a higher rate of asthma than the other, that group is inevitably gonna have somewhat lower average achievement simply because it's a drowsier group when the tests are given. Now this doesn't make a big difference, a small difference in, in creating the achievement gap, but then you begin to think of all the other social and economic conditions that African-American children come to school with that whites typically don't come to school with asthma, lead poisoning, much higher rate in African-American neighborhoods and in white neighborhoods because um, African-American uh, neighborhoods um, uh, likely have uh, older buildings, more lead point paint um, uh, 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 falling off the walls, more lead pipes delivering water. Uh, and lead poisoning has a measurable impact on IQ. Uh, those neighborhoods are the same rate reason that African-American children have greater rates of asthma, more diesel trucks driving through, more um, pollution in the environment, more manufacturing facilities nearby, uh, more deteriorated buildings, more vermin. Homelessness, economic insecurity, you begin to add all of these up, each one of them has a small contribution to the achievement gap, but when you add them all up, you've pretty much explained the achievement gap, leaving very little explanation left for lazy teachers. Well, I realized in doing this research on education, that it's one thing if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity. What happens if you have a school where every child has one or more of these challenges? How can such a school ever be expected to achieve at the same level as a school where children come well-rested, well-nourished from economically secure homes? Uh, you can't expect uh, that no matter how many laws you pass uh, requiring it. Well, we call schools where we concentrate children with these kinds of disadvantages, we call them segregated schools. And schools today are more segregated than they have been at any time in this country in the last 45 years. And the reason that they're more segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I began to think that neighborhood segregation was an educational problem. I wasn't yet thinking about housing. That took me a while longer. I was still thinking in terms of education, but beginning to focus on neighborhood segregation. And then in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision. Uh, it was a decision that involved a program that uh, two school districts, Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky, had adopted. Uh, both of those school districts uh, uh, in the, uh, enacted a very, very trivial school choice plan that gave parents the choice of which school in the district their child would attend, but if the choice was going to intensify segregation, it wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a child who wouldn't do so. So if you had an all white, a mostly white school, and you had one place left in that school, and both a black and a white child applied for that last remaining place, uh, the black child would be given some preference to help to desegregate the school. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, 
uh, invalidated this, said you couldn't do such a thing, said it was unconstitutional. The uh, controlling decision was written by Chief Justice John Roberts. He acknowledged that the schools in Louisville and Seattle were segregated. He said correctly that they're segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. And then he went on to explain that those neighborhoods are segregated. The term he was used was de facto because of private bigotry and private businesses and self-choice and income differences. And he said, we have de facto segregation, something government has had nothing to do with. It's unconstitutional to try to take explicit action to fix it. Well, I read this decision, um, uh, this de facto segregation decision. And I remembered reading about something that happened some years before in one of those school districts in Louisville, Kentucky. In Louisville, there was a white homeowner in a single family home in an all white suburb called Shively. In that suburb, uh, this white family, this white homeowner, had an African-American friend who was living in the center city of Louisville. The African-American friend had, was a decorated Navy veteran, had a wife and a child, wanted to uh, move to a single family home, but uh, nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner in this suburb of Shively bought a second home and uh, resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry mob surrounded it, protected by the police, uh, they threw rocks through the windows. They dynamited and firebombed the home. The police made no effort to stop any of this activity. But when the riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence. The white homeowner for sedition, um, for selling a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. I said to myself, um, this doesn't sound to me like de facto segregation. If the police, the courts, the entire criminal justice system is mobilized in a conspiracy to deny African-Americans -American, their rights to enforce racial boundaries in the, the metropolitan area of Louisville. Uh, it's a civil rights violation, I said to myself. This is not de facto segregation. It requires us to remedy it. We've never undertaken anything to remedy this situation. But then I looked into it further. And I found, and I'm not exaggerating here, that there were hundreds of cases of police protected, sometimes police organized and led mob violence in cities all over the country, including Chicago, to um, uh, drive African-Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in white neighborhoods. Every one of these was a civil rights violation every one of them a violation of the constitution if the police were involved in either protecting, organizing, or leading those mobs. Uh, every one of them is a violation that we have never accepted the obligation that's inherent in our citizenship to redress it. Then I began to look into it further and I found that it was not just state-sponsored violence that uh, created and maintained the racial boundaries that we have in this country today but there were many, many federal, state, and local policies, racially explicit policies uh, designed to ensure that African-Americans and whites could not live near one another in any metropolitan area of this country. I concluded, and this is what I wrote in, in the book, The Color of Law, that this uh, notion of de facto segregation is other nonsense. Uh, we have an unconstitutional system of racial segregation because of government policy. It's as unconstitutional as the segregation of schools or colleges or lunch counters or buses. Well, in the brief time we have together this evening, let me describe, um, perhaps I'll describe the major policy that the federal government followed to ensure that we be a racially segregated society. Um, in the 20th century, the early and mid 20th century, as you know, we were a manufacturing economy. Uh, none of this internet stuff all making things. And factories needed to be located in the deep water ports or railroad terminals, as did the banks and other service institutions um, that were um, uh, uh, servicing those uh, manufacturing facilities. And workers, blue collar and white collar, 
had to live close enough to those factories or banks to be able to walk to work or maybe take short, short streetcar rides. Um, not many had automobiles in those days. Uh, but in the post-World War II period, the federal government intensified a program of the Federal Housing Administration and then the Veterans Administration to move all the white workers and middle-class workers out of those urban areas where they had been working and living into single-family homes in all white suburbs like that suburb of Shively. This was a racially explicit program of the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration. They excluded African-Americans explicitly from moving to these suburbs at the time when they were affordable, both to whites and to African-Americans. You're familiar with these suburbs that the FHA and VA created. As you know, probably, we weren't a suburban country at that time. The suburbanization, the mass suburbanization took place in the post-World War II period into the 1950s and 60s. Um, the federal government's policy to move whites out of urban areas into these single family homes is what created the type of suburbanization we know today. Well, these pop programs, these, these subdivisions exist in every metropolitan area. They exist in Chicago. They exist everywhere else. Perhaps the most famous of them is Levittown, east of New York City, 17,000 homes in one place. Uh, the builder, William Levitt, could never have assembled the capital to build uh, this giant development. Uh, no bank would be crazy enough to lend it to him. They thought this was a crazy idea. We were in a suburban country. They didn't think anybody would want to live in the suburbs. The only way that Levitt or any of the other builders in Chicago or elsewhere could uh, create these subdivisions, in some cases, entire suburbs, was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, uh, uh, submitting their plans for the project, the architectural design of the homes, the materials they were going to use, the layout of the streets, and a federally required commitment never to sell a home to an African-American. The federal government even required these developers like Levitt to place a clause in the deed of every home, prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. If uh, any of you live in homes that were constructed in the 1940s, 1930s, you're likely to find such a clause in the deed of your home. Um, the, um, uh, this was not the action, the, the, this requirement of rogue bureaucrats working for the FHA or VA. It was a written requirement of the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administrations. The FHA had a manual that was distributed to appraisers all over the country whose, whose job it was to um, uh, evaluate applications of builders uh, who wanted to build these subdivisions and um, recommend or not recommend them for federal bank guarantees. The manual said that um, you couldn't recommend for a federal bank guarantee the application of a developer who was going to sell homes to African-Americans in a white subdivision. You couldn't even recommend for a federal bank guarantee uh, the application of a developer to build an all-white project that was going to be located near where African-Americans were living. Because in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal policy manual, written manual, said. Where did this notion of de facto segregation come from? It's, it's as I say, it's other nonsense. Um, in my book, The Color of Law, I have a photograph of a six foot high, half mile long concrete wall that a developer in Detroit was required by the FHA to construct to separate his development from a nearby African-American neighborhood uh, before the FHA would agree to guarantee his bank loans for that construction. Well. At the time, those homes were inexpensive. They sold roughly around the country for about, in today's money, about $100,000. Any worker, white or black, could have afforded to buy a home in these subdivisions, in these suburbs. These are places that you all live now. Most of you live now. Um, any uh, African-American with a job in the post-war economy, and we had a big post-war boom there, most had jobs, um, could have afforded these homes. Uh, especially returning war veterans require no down payment and uh, got a 20, 30 year amortized mortgage. 
those homes, as you know, available to whites, prohibited to African-Americans, now uh, sell not for $100,000, but for much, much more, $200,000, $300,000, dollars maybe uh, in some parts of the country, a million dollars. The whites who were subsidized by the federal government to buy those homes gained over the next couple of generations wealth from the equity they had in appreciating in homes that were appreciating in value. They used that wealth to send their children to college. They used it to perhaps uh, finance emergencies, um, maybe temporary unemployment or a health emergency. They used it for their retirements. Or they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren who then had down payments for their own homes. African-Americans were prohibited by explicit federal policy from participating in this wealth generating exercise. That wealth, uh, that, that denial of wealth uh, underlies the most serious social and economic problems that we face in this country today. On average, African-American incomes are about 60% of white incomes. There's a whole story behind that income gap. I don't have time for it this evening, but you would think if family incomes of, of African-Americans averaged about 60% of white family incomes, African-American wealth would average about 60% of white wealth. You can save the, save the same amount of money from the same incomes. But in reality, although there's a 60% income ratio, African-American households have wealth at 5% of, white, of the white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy. This has been remedied that we have never undertaken an obligation to remedy. That wealth gap underlies the most serious social problems that I said in this country today, I've already described the achievement gap that is largely attributable to the concentration of African-Americans in more poorly resourced, more dangerous, more polluted neighborhoods. It also underlies uh, health gaps between African-Americans and whites. African-Americans have shorter life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease because they live in those more polluted, more dangerous neighborhoods with less access to even grocery stores to sell fresh food. It underlies mass incarceration of young African-American men and police abuse of those men. I'm not suggesting that the police would never abuse an African-American man, but it's much, much more intense because when you concentrate the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods where they have no access to good jobs or the transportation to get to them, uh, it's inevitable that the police are going to engage in confrontations with them and adopt the tactics of an occupying force, not a, um, a policing force that's uh, aiming to serve and protect. Um, and the wealth gap also underlies something else, uh, the segregation that's created that I find very frightening and dangerous. And that is uh, the uh, very, very great political polarization that we have in this country today. It largely tracks racial lines. It's not entirely racial, but we'd be kidding ourselves if we didn't acknowledge that it largely tracks racial lines. How can we ever expect to develop the common national identity that we need to preserve this democracy? If so many African-Americans and whites live so far from each other that they have no ability, we have no ability to understand each other, to empathize with each other, to uh, understand each other's life experiences. Under those circumstances, we can't develop the common national identity that's needed to preserve this democracy in this very, very dangerous time. Well, the policies to redress segregation are well known, no mystery about them. Uh, uh, think tanks, uh, journalists, uh, housing experts spit out policy ideas all the time. Um, what's missing is not policy ideas. What's missing is a new civil rights movement, like the one that I talked about earlier, that's willing to make good trouble in order to mobilize, to effect the political pressure necessary to enact policies to redress segregation. The policies seem very unrealistic to us today. Uh, because we don't have such a civil rights movement. I can mention uh, one of them based on the single example that I gave you of one federal policy among many that contributed to our segregation. But I mentioned these subdivisions in your community as well as around the country where homes were affordable to African-Americans when they were built for $100,000 a piece and now sell for multiple times that. 
uh, the federal government should be buying up homes in these communities at market rates when they come up for sale and reselling them to qualified African-Americans um, at deeply discounted prices. Um, some of you are lawyers. Uh, I, I challenge you to tell me why that's not a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation uh, that should be approved by any court that acknowledge the history that I've described to you uh, today. Uh, we should be doing that anyway, uh, whether the courts acknowledge it or not. Um, we should be enacting affirmative action programs and housing all over the place in order to redress segregation. When that, uh, not just in housing, when that school district in Louisville or that school district in Seattle was told by Chief Justice John Roberts that it couldn't enact a trivial desegregation plan um, because the history of their communities had nothing to do with government participation, those school districts should have gone ahead and implemented them anyway because the decision was wrongly decided based on a fictional history of how their communities came to be segregated. Well, you may think that uh, buying up homes in your communities and reselling them at deeply discounted rates to African-Americans is a crazy idea. I'll give you a few more practical ones. It's not that I don't have practical ones as well, but also politically unrealistic in the present environment. As you may know, um, the, the biggest uh, program we have for lower income families, not the kind of uh, middle-class families who would be eligible for the kinds of subsidies I was talking about a minute ago. But the only program that we have for low-income families or significant program is something called the Low-Income Housing Tax Credit, administered by the Treasury Department that um, uh, uh, is distributed, the tax credits are distributed to uh, states, which then uh, in turn transmit them to nonprofit organizations that then sell them to developers to build low-income housing. Some of you I know, because I know many of you, uh, some of you I know are engaged in efforts to uh, uh, force the communities in which you live to create affordable housing uh, for uh, lower-income families who are disproportionately African-American. But that program reinforces segregation for the most part. You know how much difficulty you have in getting your communities to accept housing for lower income families who are disproportionately African-American and Hispanic. Uh, the uh, low income housing tax credit program today reinforces segregation because most of those low income housing tax credit programs, uh, uh, projects are located in existing low income neighborhoods simply because it's so hard. You know how hard it is. So hard to build them anywhere else. Uh, developers, even if a community were willing uh, to modify its zoning rules to accept these projects, developers would rather build them in low-income segregated neighborhoods because the land is cheaper, because they don't have to go through the hundreds of community meetings um, to explain why they're bringing black and brown people into your neighborhoods. Uh, the developers would rather um, place them in low-income segregated neighborhoods because they're easy to rent. You can put a sign in the window and eligible families will walk by and see the reference sign. So the program presently reinforces racist residential segregation, and um, it will take um, much more dramatic action to change the priorities of those programs uh, so that they don't do so. And that can only be done with an activist civil rights movement that's demanding this change. The same thing is true of the Section 8 program, which also equally um, uh, uh, reinforces segregation. It reinforces segregation because despite the fact that it's unlawful in many places of this country, but not most, to discriminate against Section 8 voucher holders, landlords manage to do it anyway. And most Section 8 voucher holders can only find housing in existing low-income neighborhoods, um, reinforcing their segregation. Uh, landlords, uh, there are few apartments available for them. The whole structure of the Section 8 program, this is a somewhat technical detail that I won't go into now, but the whole structure of the program doesn't provide a voucher that's sufficient to um, rent an apartment in a higher opportunity community and actually provides a voucher that uh, is more than is needed to uh, uh, rent an apartment in a uh, low-income segregated neighborhood. Landlords in those neighborhoods exploit the program by charging more in rent than uh, the market would otherwise require. Um, this program also needs to be reformed so that it doesn't reinforce segregation. It won't happen 
unless you and I and all the people we know are engaged in a new civil rights movement. I am working with a group of national civil rights leaders, uh, and they are creating a, something they call a new movement to redress racial segregation. Uh, their purpose is to uh, hire uh, community organizers to go into communities across the country, even communities like yours, to help create new local civil rights groups. Uh, this uh, new movement to redress racial segregation uh, plans to launch its efforts and begin placing its organizers in the new year, sometime January or shortly afterwards. Um, if any of you are um, uh, interested in uh, signing up to get the notification of this launch, I can make the link available to you uh, uh, so you can do it. Uh, the other thing I can do is uh, uh, just to give you an example of uh, another action that can be taken that doesn't require local government. Uh, the, um, I, I recently wrote an article in the uh, New York Times about a community. It's actually in California, but the same thing is true anywhere. A, a segregated community. Uh, segregated in the 1940s um, uh, for whites only. And in this article, I described the, the, the name, I named the real estate agency, the uh, bank, and the developer that created that segregated neighborhood in the 1940s. That real estate agency was absorbed by a contemporary agency that exists still in that community today. That bank was absorbed by a contemporary bank that still exists in that community today. And the developer is still operating in uh, that broader community. Those institutions should be pressed to come up with uh, funds to subsidize the movement of African-Americans into a community that they themselves segregated. When that bank and that real estate agency absorbed these smaller banks and real estate agencies, they absorbed not only the uh, financial assets and liabilities, but the moral assets of liabilities, uh, more assets and liabilities as well. So they have an obligation to do more than just hire a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, uh, but an obligation to do something meaningful to redress the segregation that they created. And you can do the same kind of research, identify the, the private institutions that created segregation in your communities and press them for a, a redress without requiring uh, majority support for public policy. Well, um, with that, I will stop. I just see a glance of the, the, I make the link available in the chat. No, I, I can't. Uh, you know, they used to say about Ger Gerald Ford that he couldn't chew gum and cross the street at the same time. I can't uh, work the chat and do this at the same time. But I can make this available to the organizer of, of your webinar. And, um, you know, if, if, uh, uh, Tracy wants to, she can um, certainly make this available to anybody who's registered. So um, with that, I want to thank you. And um, I think I've used up my time and it's time for questions. Thank you so much, Richard. Now, I know you just talk, touched on this with mobilizing a new civil rights movement, but the most common question by far that we received was, what are some concrete actions that we can take as individuals and community to address these issues? Any other concrete actions that we can take? Well, um, I mentioned a few just a minute ago. Uh, that there are local institutions that created segregation in your communities and that uh, now are um, talking about how much they believe in Black Lives Matter, but not doing much to desegregate them. And um, a local civil rights group can do something about that. I just uh, had a, I, I just interviewed for the purposes of this book today. That I'm, wor I'm working on a new book that will describe what we can do about it. And I think uh, uh, Tracy may have said that. But um, uh, so I interviewed the Cook County Assessor this afternoon. Now you may know that uh, the uh, assessment system in Cook County, as well as in every other community in this country, um, results in a system where African American neighborhoods, homeowners in African American neighborhoods pay more property tax relative to the value of their homes than homeowners in white neighborhoods pay. It's a discriminatory system. African-Americans are paying a disproportionately high share of the costs of schools, uh, libraries, uh, fire departments, whatever is supported by property taxes in your communities. The assessor, the Cook County assessor acknowledges this. He's seen the research. He says, we have to do better. 
we have to um, uh, uh, implement a more fair assessment system. And you know, I don't have time now, but I can explain to you, or I, I can also send you an article in which I have explained it, why the assessment system is discriminatory without being intended to be discriminatory, but it has a disparate impact um, on African-Americans. But so I asked them, uh, yeah, well, that's fine to do a better job going forward, but what are you gonna do about all the African-American homeowners who are overtaxed? Um, what kind of recompense are you going to give them? And um, he had no answer. So that's another sort of thing that the local civil rights movement can address. Now, the other thing is that uh, we ought to be addressing, and I, I know that, um, you know, the suburban uh, libraries that are attending this webinar today are, are mostly have white patrons. So I, I imagine there might be some with significant African-American populations, but I don't want to imply that most of the work on desegregation has to be done in white communities. A good part of it does. But we also need to improve the resources in black communities. Um, in Chicago, uh, the, um, uh, you all uh, live in communities that... Um, uh, as I said, gained more wealth than those in, in Chicago, homeowners in Chicago did, and tenants in Chicago. It's an unequal system, not that you participated in creating, but you benefited from. Well, one way that um, the um, uh, African-American neighborhoods in Chicago were impoverished was by something called contract buying. I didn't have time to get into this, but uh, not only did the FHA refuse to um, insure mortgages for African-Americans in white suburban neighborhoods, excluding them from those neighborhoods, but the FHA mostly refused to insure mortgages for African-Americans in urban neighborhoods, places like Englewood or, La or um, Lawndale or other neighborhoods in Chicago. And instead, speculators sold homes to African-Americans on, on, on an installment plan in which African-Americans gain no equity. And typically the uh, speculators would um, um, cancel their contracts at, towards the end and evict them. And they had spent all these years thinking they were buying a home and gain nothing from it. Well, we can identify the banks that finance that scheme in Chicago. And uh, all of you who live in communities that have um, more political power perhaps in the communities in Chicago ought to be engaged in uh, discussions uh, to begin with, in, with those banks that in the 20th century exploited African-Americans with this contract buying system. So that, you know, I could go on and on. Uh, as I say, I'm writing a whole book about the uh, things we can do, things you can do. The fundamental uh, point I wanna make though is that um, um, fantasizing about the ideas that the federal government, things that the federal government can do is not the way forward. Each of us has an obligation to begin to take the small steps in our local communities to be able to um, make a difference. Thank you. Our next question uh, comes from a sixth grade teacher. What do young people need to know about these issues and how can they help change the future? Oh boy, I, don't know. Did I, I didn't set up these questions, did I? Um, we have uh, created a curriculum that uh, teachers can use to teach this history accurately. As you may know, if you've read The, the Color of Law, I devoted a section in the book to the fact that um, textbooks uh, lie about this history. They promote the notion of de facto segregation. They deny that uh, the government had any role in creating the segregation of neighborhoods. And let me say that the this is not, uh, my views are not in dispute. I, I'm not a professional historian, but this book has been out for four years and no professional historian has challenged uh, the facts that I tell. It's just a factual story. It's not the, I don't, in, in the past book, I don't express any uh, opinions. That'll be for the next book about what we do about it. But we have developed a curriculum. It's free. And uh, again, I can make that, uh, the link to that curriculum available uh, after this uh, webinar, and perhaps it can be distributed and, and uh, the teachers can use it. Uh, it does require for teachers to get all the materials it requires them to register to, re to receive them, but it is free for any teacher who wants to use them. Thank you.
So like you said, your book was published uh, back in 2017. What do you see as the most significant developments, positive and or negative since then? Well, um, I don't think my book had anything to do with it. Um, the, the policeman in Minneapolis had much more to do with it than I did. Um, but the murder of George Floyd uh, has galvanized a uh, national awareness of um, racial inequality. Uh, my book has contributed to it. Um, other books have as well. Uh, some some come out uh, coming out uh, several years before mine. The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, um, for example. Um, the work of Brian Stevenson uh, with his Montgomery Museum and. Um, uh, one of my favorite groups uh, is uh, represented in, uh, in this uh, webinar today, a group of Montgomery travelers who went together in a biracial group to visit that museum. So we have a racial uh, awareness of, of uh, racial inequality today that's unprecedented in American history, unprecedented. And uh, the, what's missing is taking the next step. There's the, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, for the most part, did not evolve into local organizations that um, uh, created the kinds of civil rights activism that I've been describing. So we've made a giant step forward. Uh, there's awareness now that did not exist um, for the most part when my book was published. Uh, but um, uh, that awareness has to lead to action, not just uh, feeling good, not just feeling righteous, uh, not just taking symbolic action, but I'm taking real action to redress segregation. Thank you. What metrics should we be observing in the future to measure progress? Is integration only defined by literal proximity? Well, no, as I said before, um, redressing segregation is not only about desegregating white neighborhoods. It's also about improving the resources in existing uh, segregated black neighborhoods, such as that program I described about uh, um, remedying the, um, the contract buying system through which uh, so many African-American families were impoverished. Uh, that's a way of improving the resources in those communities. Um, uh, I think that redress segrega redressing segregation has four chief elements. One is improving the resources in low-income segregated neighborhoods. The, the lack of resources there is an effect of segregation. And if you want to redress segregation, you've got to deal with that lack of resources. Uh, secondly, is preventing the massive dislocation of existing residents from those communities as their resources improve. Because as their resources improve, more middle-class people want to move into those neighborhoods. They'll be better neighborhoods. And um, that will result in the displacement of existing residents unless we take action to uh, prevent that. And we know again what those actions are. We're just not doing them. Uh, rent control, uh, limits on condominium conversions, inclusionary zoning programs in those uh, neighborhoods, um, the freezes on property taxes for existing homeowners. Uh, there's a full menu of policies we should be enacting in order to prevent that dislocation. Uh, we're not doing it not because we don't know what to do. We're not doing it because we don't have a civil rights movement that's demanding it. Number three is, uh, as we've been talking about somewhat, improving the opportunities uh, for diversity in uh, segregated white neighborhoods, such as those that many of you live in. And number four is um, stabilizing desegregation where it exists. So that as we do open up opportunities for diversity in white neighborhoods, Whites don't leave as a result. Uh, flipping a neighborhood from a segregated white one to a segregated black or minority one. So those are four chief areas. They balance uh, all the um, dangers of uh, segregation uh, in, in redress. And I think if we maintain that balance, we can um, make progress going forward. Thank you. I'm trying to speak softly. I apologize about well, my okay. mic volume. No, no, um, no. A few uh, questions have been asked about the viability of reparations as a way to benefit groups who have been historically discriminated against. Can you speak to your thoughts on this as a potential path forward? Well, uh, I don't use the term reparations. Um, 
I don't object to people who do, but the reason I don't use the term is I think most people misunderstand it. And I'm not interested in using terms that people misunderstand, even if you, I mean, I'd rather uh, explain the substance of things rather than go into definitions with them. Most people think of reparations as a single monetary payment to the current generation of African-Americans, um, to the descendants of slavery, uh, to um, the victims of Jim Crow, a single monetary payment. Even if the federal government were ever to make such a payment, and I doubt that it ever would, uh, it would be such a token amount that it wouldn't do much to uh, affect the uh, desperate inequality that we've created in this country. Fixing that is going to be a multi-generational challenge. But if we did make a token payment of that sort, people would say, okay, we've now solved that problem. Let's move on and be more resistant to undertaking the kinds of policies that we need to uh, undertake. I'm um, a more, I, I've referred to the policies uh, as remedies. Um, and uh, there are many of them. It's not a single payment. Uh, subsidies must are part of it. I mentioned before one form of subsidy payment that's necessary in order to redress segregation. And that is a subsidy to enable African-Americans to purchase homes at, at prices that are more reasonable homes that they could have afforded when they were excluded. So um, I'm in favor of subsidies, but there are many, many policies. Some of them are costless, don't cost anything. Doesn't cost anything, for example, to um, uh, reform the low-income housing tax credit program or the Section 8 voucher program. Those are remedies of the necessary and that um, are relatively costless. So um, we need a combination of uh, expensive and inexpensive programs. Uh, all of them are remedies to redress segregation. And uh, so I prefer to use the talk about remedies than reparations. But if you want to call all of these things reparations, you can. I just think you ought to be aware that most people in the country aren't going to understand what you're talking about. They're going to misunderstand what you're talking about. Thank you. Um... Can you describe how white people's lives are also negatively affected by residential segregation? Sure. Um, I did mention one, and that is the uh, very dangerous political polarization that we have in this country that affects both whites and African-Americans um, as a result of segregation. But uh, it's no secret. I think you all know that as an industrialized country, we have a less adequate safety net we have less adequate transportation, uh, public transportation. We have um, uh, less ag adequate uh, supports for employment, uh, less adequate wage policies than other industrialized countries, less adequate medical care than other industrialized countries. And the reason for that is this political polarization that we have because a good part of the country is willing to sacrifice benefits for themselves in order to keep them from going to African-Americans. So we have entirely um, inadequate uh, social safety net, inadequate infrastructure, inadequate health care, uh, compared to other industrialized countries. We're the richest country in the world. And yet we have less adequate uh, resources in all of these aspects than comparable countries. And the reason is our racial segregation. Thank you. Um, with many people remaining in the cities and communities in which they grew up, how long will it take to reverse segregation? Forever, if we don't get started now. Do I need to say more? The faster we get started, the faster we move, the faster it'll take. It will be multi-generational. Um, we can make progress in this generation, a lot of progress. But I don't think we're going to fix it in my lifetime entirely, but I'd like to see some progress. Absolutely. I think we have time for one more question. Many of the questions we received discussed integrating suburban communities, but a few people asked about the impacts of segregation on urban communities. Can you speak to how things like gentrification and divestment from lower income neighborhoods impact segregation? Well, Courtney, I think I answered that exact question earlier. Um, the, uh, uh, we need to uh, redress segregation in urban neighborhoods um, and prevent massive dislocation as they improve 
uh, the policies to do that, a rent control, um, limits on condominium conversions, uh, uh, inclusionary zoning programs, freezes on property taxes, and uh, redressing of uh, the um, institutions, uh, 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 calling on the institutions to contribute to this poor resources in those communi uh, uh, communities, like, for example, the banks that uh, engage in uh, financing the contract sales, calling on those institutions to make substantial contributions to um, uh, redress segregation. You know, after the murder of George Floyd, they all uh, hired uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion officers. That's fine, but we need more than that. Are we at time, Tracy? I, no, I was actually going to jump in and ask one last question myself. Go for it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I thought a good one to end on is um, how can we stay motivated on this long road to equity and how can we encourage others to get involved? Well, um, you know, that's really a question um, that you have to answer. I think um, if you engage with each other in local groups, the biracial groups in particular, and that may uh, require uh, traveling uh, to other communities to um, create uh, multiracial groups. Uh, but uh, I think you can buck up each other. And uh, as uh, participants in the civil rights movement of the 1960s did, and uh, get prepared for a struggle that's not going to be overnight. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, Richard, uh, for your insights, for you know, spending your time with us tonight. And I also want to give a big thank you to Courtney for doing the moderation. So, um, and thank you to everyone who came to learn um, for the questions that you gave us when you registered. So just as a heads up, because I did get a lot of questions on this, we will be sending out a recording to this program. Um, give us two days just to make sure we can edit it and get it looking really nice for you. Um, and we'll also share some of the resources Richard mentioned. Um, when you exit out of this program, you're gonna see a very short survey. We would really, really appreciate your feedback. So if you could take a moment to fill that out, um, we would really appreciate it. And thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.